Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's session. My name is Bin, and I will be your moderator and host. Before I introduce you to the speakers, I have a few housekeeping items. All the participants are automatically unveiled throughout the session. We will be using Slack to communicate, and uh, we will be using Slack to, to communicate. So please take a moment to join us on the community Slack channel. And I already pasted, uh, copy and paste the Slack address in the chat box. You can just join us on the Slack channel. If you have any issues joining the Slack, you can also send me your question. I can share it with the group and also uh, post it on Slack channel. Uh, in today's session, I first give you a very brief logistic introduction. Then we will have Tony and you write to present their very good work with Presto and Aluxio in AWS. And later, we will have a Q&A session in the end, and we can answer all your questions. Um, without further ado, oh, by the way, today's session is recorded and will be available for on-demand playback, and we will email you with the link to the presentation. Without further ado, let's have Kuni and Uri, and please introduce yourself again and start with the presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Kuni Hills. Uh, I'm the uh, CEO of Data Sapiens and one of the co-founders. And with me, I have... Uh, hi, I'm Uri, and I'm the CEO of Data Sapiens. Hello all, and thank you for attending. So uh, let me just share the presentation. Uh, I hope this is all uh, visible to you. So first, I would like to thank Alexio for hosting this session. Uh, second, I would like to thank all of you who joined. Uh, we are really looking forward to sharing our learnings with you. To that purpose, we are aiming to talk through the following agenda. We will start off with a brief introduction to data sapiens, who we are and what we do. So Followed by I still cannot see the screen. OK, let me just. Sorry, yeah. does it go yeah. now? Yeah, OK, it's, it's a little too now. Cool, thanks. OK, so point three. So we will then deep dive into the observations whilst implementing a lecture, which we will then aim to quantify better through reproducible example using the TPCDS data sets and conclude with some general recommendations around cloud data lake architectures. So about data sapiens, uh, we were founded in 2014 by combining experts from technology, data, and business experience, as we believe that it is at this intersection that successful data products are created. We have three products. We operate in 15 countries and in just over 100 million records weekly. Our aim is to help clients turn data into profit. We do this with three products. The three products I described earlier are the following, personalized offers, business insights, and brands insights. Personalized offers are all about increasing customer engagement, sales, and margin from your customers. We introduce a simple plan to review process to continuously measure and improve the loyalty lifecycle of your customers. Business insights is our BI with embedded insights framework that helps you to become data-driven. And Brands Insights is our platform to drive supplier collaboration and commercialize your data assets. We're proud to have some of the following users of our products. We have retailers such as Marks & Spencer, Macro, and Circle K, and FMCG suppliers such as Coke, P&G, and Colgate. We also have pharmacy chains Phoenix, Venu, and pharmaceutical suppliers such as Teva and Sanofi. We also have a partnership with Nielsen in Asia. Now, to discuss our infrastructure journey, I will pass on to Yurai Pohanka, who will be talking us through. Hello, and thank you. So, roughly one and a half year ago, our entire data warehousing infrastructure was based on Redshift. We had several running Redshift clusters, which were powering all our ETL processes our data sapiens platform, and many internal analytical tools. This setup had the benefit of simplicity. Redshift has a nice and intuitive UI, and all responsibility regarding maintenance is done by AWS. Redshift is a transactional distributed database, 
Hence, it is a good choice when doing traditional OLTP oriented data warehousing. However, there are also a few shortcomings. Redshift has a storage compute coupled architecture. And Swan cannot scale storage and compute independently. Another specific attribute of Redshift is the query compilation for achieving higher performance. For data workloads with more or less static queries, this is an excellent feature. But for ad hoc data analysis, this becomes a performance bottleneck. Moreover, Redshift is AWS specific. Hence, we had a vendor locking of a crucial part of our infrastructure. To address the requirement of independent scalability in both storage and compute dimensions, we have decided to migrate to the Hadoop ecosystem. This vast open source ecosystem provides a pluggable, compositional data warehouse architecture made of tools where each tool has a specific purpose. These are the attributes that we were looking for. It is a common pattern to choose Hadoop HDFS as a distributed full tolerance storage, Hive for creating a SQL layer on top of HDFS, Presto as a distributed query engine, and Spark for ETL. We have decided to go with this set of software components, except for HDFS. There, we decided to use directly S3 as a data storage. We would use Spark via EMR, but all other components we would have in containerized deployments. Our Presta clusters would then be accessed by our data sapiens platform, as well as by all our internal analytical tools. Via this architecture, we would have storage compute separation and would have a greater query performance due to zero query compilation times. However, this architecture had one unforeseen flaw. Using S3 for direct data query resulting in S3 API cost greatly exceeding our expectation. Due to this issue, we had to revise our architecture and come up with a feasible solution. We still wanted to have S3 as our single source of truth data store, but we knew that we needed to be able to throttle the number of requests sent to S3. Among our initial considerations was using Hadoop's HDFS as a simple data orchestration layer sitting between S3 in a data processing system. This would, however, require running synchronization jobs between HDFS and S3. We were, we were also aware of a lock show, mostly due to its capability of storing data in a multi-tiered way, with the fastest, fastest tier being in memory storage. A lock show has the functionality of checking the underfile system for changes, hence eliminating any needs for external data synchronization. After several solution proposals, we decided to go with Alakshio. Pretty soon after deploying the refined architecture into production, we could see the benefits. The query performance has increased greatly and the S3 API costs dropped to a negligible level. Today, we run several co-located Alakshio Presto clusters for our clients where from individual clients, we have hundreds of users. Here we will describe how we observe the significance of S3 API costs when directly querying from S3. When we were designing our Hadoop-based infrastructure, we needed to understand each of its components. More specifically, we needed to fine-tune the Presto clusters in order to achieve a reasonable performance under a given user workload. Apart from the configuration of our software stack, we have also redesigned our data warehouses. When using Redshift, we use, we use the common star and snowflake schemas for the design of the table entities. For our new approach, 
we, we wanted to migrate to a more OLAP-based model in which we would keep all entities pre-joined in a few OLAP queues. This would minimize the need to do expensive joins on the fly. In the process of choosing a feasible pair of software configuration a data and database design, we conduct several performance tests on our first Presto cluster. The cluster and all additional components were deployed in a Docker Swarm cluster. We used our internal performance tools that would send query requests to Presto, which would then send requests to the S3 API. <clears throat> and it was during this period of performance tests when we detected a dramatic increase in our S3 API costs. The following AWS cost chart depicts the daily S3 API costs made by our Presto cluster. The days with higher costs correspond to the days when the performance tests were conducted. Other days with seemingly minuscule S3 API costs are the days when we were revising our data warehouse designs or the configuration of the software stack. We have summarized our daily performance test query loads into the following table. We tested a total number of 23 queries on the one year of clients retail data stored in a few OLAP cubes in the parquet format and all partitioned by the time range of one ISO week. The next table depicts the comparison of the ST API costs with the infrastructure costs for the performance tests. We can also see what percentage of the total costs the S3 API occupy. And in the majority of the cases, this is above 50%. Regarding the workload, we tested different concurrency levels ranging from 1 to 150 concurrently running queries. As mentioned before, using Galaxio solved this issue with this significant S3 API costs, hence reducing them to below $1 a day. For a better quantitative understanding of S3 API costs when querying directly from S3, we have made a simple reproducible test on the TPC DS dataset. For such tests, we have used two separate clusters. One was an Alaxio show Presto cluster using Presto SQL used in production, and the second one was an EMR cluster with Presto DB. The reason why we could do this is that regarding the request counts to S3 API, S3 API, Presto SQL, and Presto DB are equivalent. The second cluster also serves as a reference point for testing the S3 API costs for AWS provisioned Hadoop stack. We have used the TPC DS dataset with a scale factor 100 which was stored in an S3 bucket. We have executed each query from the TPCDS suit with the exception of query number 72 due to long query times. Each query has been executed exactly 10 times and we have executed all of them in a sequential manner, thus with concurrency level equal to one. For measuring the per query request counts to the Alexio file system, we've used the file in terms of logical operation and the get file info RPC operation. For the measurements on S3, we use the total counts and costs per request type. The following table contains the 10 most request expensive queries. We can see that the average requests via the file info SCAD operation for the first four queries is about 100,000. To put these numbers in a better perspective, our TPCDS dataset as few table entities that are partitioned by either a time range or by a specific grouping of products. The data set overall has around 12,000 files. We have observed that these queries require five to 10 times higher requests than what is the total number of files. This implies that Presto sends several requests to the same set of files during query executions. And these two tables are the cumulative request counts and the total S3 API costs for each request type for the Alexio Presto cluster. As we can see, 
the cumulative SGAPI costs are quite negligible. And here we have the cumulative SGAPI request counts and the costs for each request type for the EMR crystal cost. In order to somehow estimate the per query SGAPI costs, we did a naive approach with few simplifications. First, we assumed only the total SG API costs and have not done a cost estimation for each SG API request type. The reason for this is that we assume that each query demands proportionally the same number of requests for each request type. Secondly, we assume that there is a linear relationship between per query request demands in the actual file system and the per query request demands in S3. With these two assumptions combined, we did a cost estimation by distributing the total costs to each query proportionally to its number of requests sent to the Alloxio file system. And as the table outlines, individual executions of the 10 most API request expensive queries already creates a quite noticeable cost. Here we see the comparison of the infrastructure and the SG API costs for both clusters. <coughs> Excuse me. And as it is apparent, a lot show makes a huge difference in the resulting SG API costs. When used, a lot show reduces the SG API cost to 0.58% of the total, hence negligible. When not used, it makes 48.83% of the total costs, so nearly half of the cost is being spent on a small service within a large service set in AWS. Now, what do these results imply for a generic data lake architecture? Looking at the pricing models of the three largest cloud providers, hence AWS, Azure, and GCP, we can see that they are very similar to each other. Consequently, we can expect similar levels of cost differences between data lake architectures with and without a data orchestration layer. This claim, however, still needs to be verified for the case of Azure and GCP. Real life production data workloads exhibit far higher storage and compute demands than the TPCDS example workload that we have analyzed in terms of S3 API costs. Therefore, the cost reduction in these workloads would be far more significant, and deploying a lot show in them would even be more beneficial. To summarize our findings and learning, it is vital to implement a data orchestration layer between the cloud storage service and the target data processing system. And for such purpose, Alakshio is a very suitable data orchestration solution. With this being said, I would like to thank you for all your time and your attention. And we are eager to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Uh, very cool. We have one question in the question box, let me, uh, yeah, I will share this on the Slack too. Uh, the, the question is from Anuj Jane. We are using Athena, Athena, so how we can configure this with Athena as we're facing the same problem of higher S3 cost? Mm, well, we never implemented Athena into production because we saw many shortcomings of, of using Athena. Well, one uh, quite for us visible shortcoming was that uh, there was any limitations on the, let's say, scanned partitions. This, this, uh, this is probably during the fact that it uses Hive underneath and it's using the default Hive settings. So uh, we cannot, uh, unfortunately, give you any advice in terms of Athena uh, because we decided to bypass it completely. And since, because uh, Athena behind the scene is just Hive coupled with Presto. So if it is possible, I would advise to migrate from Athena to something uh, 
to more like your own sort of, you know, uh, deployments where you can have complete control of, of the entire, say, uh, infrastructure. Yeah, actually, I, I want to also add on that. So basically, um, in the past, we have been asked quite a few times how we can integrate this with Athena. And I don't think that like, if I'm the community, there is a known solution to put Aluxio in the Athena stack. The next question is from Du Li. Uh, I know Du from for a long time is also a very uh, like active Aluxio community contributor. How about, the question is, how about S3 API costs on the ETL side? I think like uh, Yura and Kunin, you talked about the on the query side, TPCDS query, and what 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 is the cost look like for the ETL? The, for the ETL, questions? there is also there are also always spikes that we detect. However, they are not that much significant as in the case of uh, querying, say data retrieval. But we are also migrating slowly to deploying Alexio co-located with Spark so that we can also throttle this. So the question, the answer is yes, but we don't have, we are mostly batch oriented at this time. So uh, there are always like these uh, more cost spikes when using Spark in EMR, but so far there are, they aren't that much significant as is in the case of data retrieval via Presto querying. But yeah, they would be more uh, visit more significant if, say, we would have uh, some like streaming solution or streaming ingestion applied. So far, that's not the case. Uh, otherwise, we would be also forced to uh, uh, to quickly apply a luxury also to uh, Spark or say with Kafka. Yeah, I don't know, do if you have some further follow up on this. Uh, the next question is 100 uh, percent with the focusing on data orchestration, have you used a JSync? Mm, no. And uh, we're not very familiar with it. Yeah, me neither. Uh, next question. Regarding query performance, next question from Xin Hen. Regarding query performance, are there any benchmark comparison between Athena and Alexio? Not the ones we would be aware of. So, but I I can reference to some article published by uh, the internal Alexio, like the ex experts. There has been like a paper on the TPCDS data set when compared when say deploying Presto or Spark co-located and not co-located on the lecture, but I don't recall personally any sort of a paper or article which would compare these two. And also maybe if I, if I can add something to this, uh, one of the reasons we moved away from Redshift was to be, you know, more optimal around storage and compute. And due to some limitations in uh, Athena, you can't really distribute your data as well as you want, and that brings a lot of performance uh, bottlenecks that we actually also had with Redshift back into play and therefore we skipped that uh, stage as, as you I mentioned. So the next question is from Du. Uh, he wants to, he wants me to rephrase the answer, but unfortunately I was focusing on copy things out to the Slack channel, share it on the Slack channel, but this will be, uh, can, this will be included in the playback or Du, I can talk to you offline. We can just always go back to the playback and check out uh, the answer. And also uh, for you, Ryan, you can, you can always go to our Slack channel. I posted the questions there. So you can, if you think there's something, any, anything you want to qualify further, you can just put it under the question. So the next yes. question is, uh, uh, is also from Giatri. What tool did you use for data orchestration? We have a large on-premise cluster and we will use cloud for metered analytics work. Mm, well, if, well, if they have a, like a large on-premise cluster deployed, <coughs> excuse me, then I would also go for, for Alexio in, in terms of the say cloud deployment for the uh, metrics, because uh, you would definitely have frequent pinging of uh, say, you know, uh, ingesting the new streams of uh, the login messages or the login information or metrics. So you would have a frequent 
without a lock show, you definitely you could you might have frequent uh, temporal persistence of small changes in say S3, which would then mount ramp up to tremendous costs. So either temporarily persist them in say an EC2 instance or in an EC2 cluster and then uh, back them up to S3 via some periodical snapshots. The the main aim here is to really throttle the number of requests sent to S3. So to have it fully under control. That's the main aim. And I'm not sure if this advice would help. So uh, I actually I want to jump in here to chime in. Uh, if you have data on, you have a large on-premise cl cluster, you have data on on-premise, and you want to use cloud for uh, analytics, actually that's one of the target use case for Alexio to have this we call hybrid model, hybrid cloud. You have the resource in different locations, in public cloud, in private cloud. And that's actually uh, where Alexio, I do believe Alexio can help. So I already post this in the Slack channel and then tag a team member who is uh, leading the effort in the hybrid cloud uh, to help to help you on this question if you want to further explore different operation, uh, different possibilities. Uh, I, I believe he will come and provide more answers there, but definitely mm -hmm. Alexio can help. Uh, next question, oh, we have a lot of questions today. The next question is from Alec Swan. Uh, let me just post this on Slack. So uh, it's clear how caching helps because uh, when the same query is rerun multiple times, but how does Alexio help with uh, exploratory data analysis and analysis where targeted data sets changes frequently where opportunities for data caching are low? How does election help in this case? Uh, so, if say the data that you are querying is frequently mutated, then Alaksha would definitely help uh, because if you are ingesting the data the data into Alaksha, say via a streaming service, which the latest Alaksha 2.3 has more broader support, then uh, this helps definitely. Also in terms of querying the data, but also throttling the read-write requests to, to S3. This is like my current understanding of the, the question. Yeah, so actually uh, I want to add on that. There are multiple different ways a you can help, like caching the data. And uh, there are multiple different ways you can mutate the data. And uh, as I see most often, it's adding more files in the partition or you're just adding more partitions and uh, less frequently people mutate existing uh, partitions but that's still possible like so in that case uh, a lux you can at least still catch the existing part of the data inputs and also uh, like we, i know we're we're working on some uh, mechanism to better sync with the Luxio between Luxio and the s3 so in the latest uh, 2.3 release, there is a lot of improvement in the uh, we call act active sync feature. So once there is something changed on the S3, uh, we will have this data change reflected in Alexio in a much faster way where we do a lot of, lot of uh, smart and smart things to optimize this performance. So hopefully this can uh, resolve at least partly the concern about mutating data in S3. And this is really about uh, the cache coherency. Uh, the next question is, what? Uh, this is from uh, still from Alex Swan. Uh, what sort of compression does Alexio use? How does it compare in terms of efficiency, size, etc., to ORC, Parquet, and JSON files format? Uh, well, here, I mean, uh, Alexio can catch uh, any sort of a file format, but we are exclusively using Parquet or ORC in our production. We receive uh, compressed text files and CSV files from the client, but we are always trying for optimized storage, optimized for data workloads. So, so the most, the probably the only types of uh, files that we are caching are exclusively Parquet and ORC. Yeah, and also I would say uh, it's not really, so Alexa itself, 
in the in in the in the in the community version of Luxio, we can think that's the that's the data you cache. It's it agnostic to the file format. So in S3, the data can be in ORC, in Parquet, in JSON, or in TXT file formats. That's all fine. But once the data is cached into Luxio, it's a it's a bit stream. So it's agnostic to the file format. But <laughs> I don't have a but here. There is a service. There is a new uh, feature called uh, Structured data service in Alexio. So uh, the core idea, the key idea here is when you store data in a three in certain format, for example, it's a non, uh, it's it's a highly compressed or this is a non uh, columnar, but you want to query the data in a columnar way, then Alexio structured data service, after understanding the data schema, it can transform the data. Uh, it provides a transformation jobs to transform the data into certain columnar formats like Parquet. So the data will be more uh, friendly to be queried by things like Presto. So that's a one a new feature we added recently into Aluxio. Uh, the, the basically the bet is you can have different formats, different compression level when you store data versus how you consume the data in Aluxio. Yeah. Uh, next question. Have you got any advice for getting Alexio approved as a loud tool in a large corporate with restricted IT? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, if it's uh, supposed to be like uh, in a restricted zone or in, in an internet of a large corporation, then I would definitely Try it uh, if it's you know if it's uh, fit the use case of whatever the use case they might have a large corporation which should also be like data oriented quite a bit uh, yeah so uh, I, would, I would definitely at least try the use case you know if not every solution is perfect for everything there's no like a silver bullet but re really try it if it fits the given purpose uh, the given case. So yeah, mostly we've seen that Alexio is used as a you know as a bridge between on-prem and cloud. We demonstrated that it also has benefits pure on the cloud. So uh, definitely it will have some benefits uh, when provisioned locally or provisioned on-premise exclusively. Cool. The next question is from Cal. Uh, he is also an active Alexio community contributor. What? But this question is about Presto. What monitoring tool do you use to your price cluster? Uh, we use the standardized, uh, the, the standard Prometheus monitoring system in conjunction with uh, Elasticsearch and uh, Kibana dashboards uh, connected to it. Then also the JMX uh, probes uh, for, for you know for probing and monitoring each nodes in a cluster. So problem solved. Just the usual stack. Okay, that's that's all the question I have today. Uh, it's a lot. Seems like uh, the all the, the the this talk is very engaging. We have a lot of questions. People want to understand more details and how they can apply the similar experience and technology. Yeah. So um, I think we have a few more few more minutes. We can stay here stay here for a few more minutes. Uh, so actually, I want to have I, I have a question for you guys. Um, so Kuni and you, right? I know you have been trying out Alexio in the uh, like we we have some conversation starting last year, end of last year. And uh, what's the, for example, what's the most challenging part, and what's the most encouraging part when you are onboarding this new technology? Uh, as a, like a part of the feedback, I want to get some feedback from you guys. Well, maybe uh, what was slightly challenging, how to come up with some uh, methods of how efficiently sort of a hydrate or occupy the cluster with uh, data. Okay. Because uh, when you kind of, uh, depending on the cluster size, we, we slightly have some issues that when you kind of uh, uh, hydrate the, the cluster, mm -hmm. uh, the presto sometimes isn't, isn't responding due to some like high uh, split issues but this is like a temporary effect uh, i think this is due to some like internal indexation on the electro side because it's it, 
it needs to suddenly absorb a, a large amount of data. So it needs to, you know, scan the file system to scan an index the file system. So, yeah, uh, you know, uh, we have, you know, we have uh, at least three components here, a lot show high compressor, which are three uh, separate systems. So there's lots of like non-trivialities, non-linearities in between them. So, yeah, but it's more like a generic thing when adopting new technology. But yeah, yeah, mostly we had to uh, create like some artificial scripts on hydrating the cluster in this uh, in this regard, and also uh, the, the internal architecture of Alaxio isn't currently that much oriented into uh, like elasticity in terms of the size. Meaning, if you kind of add new nodes to cluster, the data, for example, doesn't get rebalanced. Hence. You you may slightly lose some performance benefit which you would normally get from the collocation benefit. So, so this is maybe something slightly that if this would be implemented in a lot show that would be much like greater. It would then serve a more broader case of you know uh, problems. And so yeah. maybe this, yeah maybe this like cluster hydration and cluster uh, scaling uh, scalability or cluster upscaling yeah maybe this but so far we're satisfied with uh, what is currently we if there are some issues that we managed to simply bypass them yeah I, actually this is a really uh, um i mean <laughs> anyone working this space understands when you are operating multiple different distributed systems like how complicated it can be but i'm glad like uh, finally you uh, you come through the journey and find that it's useful. Actually, uh, on this end, I want to ask you, like, a, did you expect the API request the cost reduction in the beginning, or this is something you found, like, a, someday, you just find this suddenly, out of blue? Uh, we found it very immediately, because when we conducted the first series of tests, we received a notification from AWS cost center that our A3 API costs have increased by several thousand, several thousand percent. So that quickly got our attention. Mm. So it was, it was pretty much very soon. <laughs> we you know, we cool. had this version of Presto deployment that this would be easy. So just like a rudimentary performance test. But after this experience, we immediately, we immediately knew that we're still not ready to deploy the production that that fast so we had to do like several like revisions but, yeah, but it was pretty much immediate. this is really cool I, I think this is a um this is something like reminding us we need to watch the aws bill frequently to to notice if there are any change for good or for bad cool this is a very education of session for me uh, at least that uh, i i learned a lot from your talk and we also published this work in the Alexio blog. I will post it uh, in, the, in, the, in the Slack channel. So it's a, it's a, I think this is a very, very interesting work and a lot of people can potentially benefit from, from your work. Thank you so much, Yuri and Kuni. This is really, really cool. Yeah, and also regarding these like, maybe our like findings or some like, let's say imperfection, but say, some slight uh, lack of functionality. We post we post a GitHub issue regarding the uh, rebalancing of the data. So, so so if you would have some time to spend on it to open like a discussion, I think we and other members of the community would benefit. From it. Yep, 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 definitely we will. Very cool. Thank you so much, and thanks for everyone joining today's session. If you have further questions you want to clarify. Uh, always go to our Slack channel as I posted in the chat box, and we can always iterate, discuss there. Uh, in the end, yeah, thank you. Thank you to speakers. This is really, really very.